Uh, hey guys, um, welcome. Just come on in and take a seat whenever you feel the need to. So we're going to start out with a video and then we'll roll right into things. Just enjoy this here video and, you know, relax and everything. I know with all my heart He's got the whole world in his hands He's got the whole world in his hands I feel no evil for you are with me Strong to deliver, mighty to save He's got the whole Okay, hey again everybody, um, welcome to our second ever youth service, and uh, I just wanted to point it out that apparently I'm the only one who got the memo to dress formally, so I'm a bit offended. So um, our little theme for tonight is why do good things, or I mean why, <laughs> I mix that up a little bit, <laughs> so why do bad things happen to good people, how about that? Um, so it's time to relax and worship God, guys. It's going to be a really awesome night. We have a video to show you. It's going to be like really coolio. So, yeah. And that. What do you guys think of that song? Huh? Was that pretty good to do it in church? Huh? <laughs> Can you think we ever do it on Sunday morning? Huh? What would happen if we do that on Sunday morning? <laughs> <laughs> Right. We're glad that you're with us tonight, as Megan said, and so thanks for coming back our second month. And so tonight, the teens, they picked the theme. And so last month, they picked about suffering. Um, good. I, I like your, you were saying, why do, um, what was that? It was the opposite of our, our line. The, yeah, why do good people? Good things happen to bad people. That's what we should say. That would be the same theme tonight as well. What we like to do now is show you an interview that we did last service a month ago. Talking about this theme, why do good things, uh, bad things happen to good people? Watch the interview. Megan, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, I think that's just life. I mean, lots of things happen to really good people. Like, Jesus got crucified. It's just one of those things. I mean, bad things happen to bad people too. It's just, it's life really. Like. That's my answer. It's not a very good answer, but that's my answer. <laughs> um, Mandy, why do you think bad things happen to good people? Um, I think that it's um, everything happens for a reason, and God has a reason, because if he didn't, then he, it wouldn't happen. Yes, that's completely correct. Why do you guys think bad things happen to good people? We think because the devil is trying to pull you away from your faith. Good answer. Thank you. Hi, Natasha. Um, why do you think bad things happen to really good people? Well, I think bad things happen to really good people because God is testing our faith. And it also strengthens us and our characteristics. And not to quote a totally random person, but um, there's a song called What Doesn't Kill You Make you Stronger, Makes You Stronger. Uh, Kelly Clarkson. Yep. Yep. That's, that's a really good answer. I like hey, Sarah. So why do you think bad things happen to good people? To make them stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yes. Why do bad things happen to good people? Just does. I mean, it's how God planned it. So if he if it happens, then just you got to remember that that's how God planned it. So there's always a purpose to it. So it's not useless. I mean, so yeah. Okay. We're approaching a group of teenagers. Teenagers, come here. Okay. Really quick. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Okay. Why do you think bad things happen to good people? Uh, well, they get themselves involved in like bad things, so totally. so try to make it better, so so that they get they'll they get in trouble for it. You sir, got nothing. <laughs> he doesn't have anything. Why do you think bad things happen to good people? Because God is testing them of how good they are. That's true. Good good answer. Thank you. Why do bad things happen to good people? Bad things happen to good people, so they know what good things are. Thank you. Why do you think bad things happen to good people, Jack? Uh, Satan has a hand in that. Quite true, sir. Why do you think bad things happen to good people? 
Why do I think bad things happen? Why you gotta get me on the spot? <laughs> Freaking out with the camera in the face. Um, bad things happen to good people because unfortunately evil and the devil exist. And he likes to shake us up a bit. And that's how he does that. He doesn't shake us up in a good way either? No, he doesn't. Not like a dancey way? Right. Why do you think bad things happen to good people? Because they need to learn a lesson. That's true. Because there's something they haven't learned and God needs to teach them how to deal with something. That is a very, very good point you have there. Okay. I like that. Thank you. Why do you think bad things happen to good people? I think it's a test from God to make you stronger and to uh, make you more in his his guidance. Yeah. Ooh, that sounded violent. That was Breaking violent. news. <laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome. Let's go. Let's let's thank everybody to the interview. Um, those are all excellent answers. And so tonight we're just going to look at a story in the Bible in the Old Testament. And so let's hit the lights, Job. If you, uh, Job, <laughs> Jordan, you're Job. And let's have our our reader seer up here. They're going to to guide us this evening in our study in our message. It's a. Uh, many of you know this book, and um, make sure you got all your notes up here, guys. And um, Drew is Job. All right, and it's in the Old Testament, and this story is a. We believe it's a true story in the Bible, and it happened between Abraham, Isaac, Jacob time. Um, he had everything going for him. He was really blessed, and you're going to hear that. And so let's begin our reader's theater tonight. Um, with Job was a man who lived in Uz. He was honest inside and out, a man of his word, who was totally devoted to God and hated evil with passion. He had seven sons and three daughters. He was also very wealthy. Seven thousand head of sheep, three thousand camels, five hundred teams of oxen, five hundred donkeys, and a huge staff of servants. The most to join them in their merrymaking. When the parties were over, Job would get up early in the morning and sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children, thinking, Maybe one of them sinned by defying God inwardly. Job made a habit of this sacrificial atonement, just in case they'd sinned. One day, when the angels came to report to God, Satan, who was the designated accuser, came along with them. God singled out Satan and said, What have you been up to? Oh, you know, going here, going there, checking things out on earth. God said to Satan, Have you noticed my friend Job? There's no one quite like him, honest and true to his word, totally devoted to God and hating evil. So do you think Job does that all out of sheer goodness of his heart? Why, no one has ever had it so good. You pampered him like a pet, make sure nothing bad ever happens to him or his family or his possessions. Blessed everything he does. He can't lose. But what do you think would happen if you reached down and took away everything that is his? He'd curse you right to your face. That's what. We'll see. Go ahead. Do what you want with all that is his. Just don't hurt him. Then Satan left the presence of God. Sometime later, while Job's children were having one of their parties at the home of the oldest son, a messenger came to Job and said, in the field next to us when the Sabians attacked. They stole the animals and killed the field hands. I'm the only one to get out alive to tell you what happened. While they were still talking, another messenger arrived and said, Bolts of lightning struck the sheep and the shepherds and fried them, burned them, they burned them to a crisp. I'm the only one to get out alive and tell you what happened. While they were still talking, another messenger arrived and said, Your children, your children were having a party at home of the oldest brother when a tornado swept off the desert and struck the house. It collapsed on the young people and they died. I'm the only one to get out alive and tell you what happened. 
While they were still talking, another messenger arrived and said, okay. I don't know how to say this one. Chaldeans. Chaldeans. Chal Chaldeans coming from three directions raided the camels and massacred the camel drivers. I'm the only one to get alive and tell you what happened. It's not your day. Job got to his feet, ripped his robe, shaved his head, then fell to the ground and worshipped. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I'll return to the womb of the earth. God gives, God takes. God's name be ever blessed. Not once through all this did Job sin. Not once did he blame God. You guys stay right up here. You think that's bad enough, right? He lost his job, all his animals, his shepherds, and then his children. And he was a faithful parent that he would worship and sacrifice for any of his kids' sins. So he's a righteous guy doing the right thing, and he lost his, his profession and his children. When it rains, though, what happens? It pours. One day, when the angels came to report to God, Satan also showed up. God singled out Satan, saying, And what have you been up to? Satan answered God, Oh, going here and there, checking things out. Then God said to Satan, Have you noticed my friend Job? There's no one quite like him, is there? Honest and true to his word, totally devoted to God and hating evil. He still has a firm grip on his integrity. You tried to trick me into just destroying him, but it didn't work. A human would do anything to save his life, but what do you think would happen if you reached down and took away his health? He'd curse you to your face, that's what. God said, All right, go ahead. You can do what you like with him, but mine... Mind you, don't kill him. Satan left God and struck Job with terrible sores. Job had ulcers and scabs from head to foot. They itched and oozed so badly that he took a piece of broken pottery to scrape himself, then went and sat on a trash heap among the ashes. His wife said, Still holding on to your precious integrity, are you? Curse God and be done with it. While he told her, you're talking like an empty-headed fool. We take the good days from God. Why not also the bad days? Not once through all this did Job sin. He said nothing against God. All right. Now, not only is his livelihood taken away, but also his family, but now his health. Now, the first part, we're a little nervous, is that here comes Satan to God, coming and God allows the audience now what happens next is his friends come and the first several days they don't say a word that's a good friend just to sit there when you can't relate to what's going on but listen what happens next how they view God one of the friends we're going to use tonight and see how everyone views God during suffering three of Job's friends heard of all the trouble that had fallen on him each traveled from his own country. Eliphaz from Taman, Bildad from Shaha, Zophar from Namath, and went together to Job to keep him company and comfort him. When they first caught sight of him, they couldn't believe what they saw. They hardly recognized him. They cried out in lament, ripped their robes, and dumped dirt on their heads as a sign of their grief. Then they sat with him on the ground. Seven days and nights they sat there without saying a word. They could see how rotten he felt how deeply he was suffering. Job starts to talk. Why didn't I die at birth? My first breath out of, my womb, out of the womb, my last. Why were there arms to rock me and breasts for me to drink from? I could be resting in peace now, asleep forever, feeling no pain. In the company of kings and statemen in their royal ruins, or the princes resplendent in their gold and silver tombs, why wasn't I still born and buried? With all the babies who never saw light, where are the wicked no longer tr trouble anymore, the bone-weary people to get along deserve rest? Prisoners sleep undisturbed, never again to wake up to the bark of the guards. The small and the great are equal in that place, and slaves are free from their masters. Then Job's friend Eliphaz from Taman spoke up. Would you mind if I said something to you? Under the circumstances, it's hard to keep quiet. You yourself have done this plenty of times, spoken words that clarify and encourage those who were about to quit. Your words have put stumbling people on their feet, put fresh hope in people about to collapse, but now you're the one in trouble. You're hurting. You've been hit hard and you're reeling from the blow, but 
you shouldn't devote, devout, <laughs> sorry, but shouldn't your devout life uh, give you confidence now? Shouldn't your exemplary life give you hope? Think, has a truly innocent person ever ended up on a scrap heap? Do you genuinely, sorry, do genuinely upright people ever lose out in the end? It is my observation that those who plow evil and sow trouble reap evil and trouble. One breath from God and they fall apart. One blast of his anger and there's nothing left of them. The mighty lion, king of the beast, roars mightily, but when he's toothless, he's useless. No teeth, no prey, and the cubs wander off to fend for themselves. If I were in your shoes, I'd go straight to God. I'd throw myself on the mercy of God. So what a blessing when God steps in and corrects you. Mind you, don't despise the discipline of Almighty God. True, he wounds, but he also dresses the wound. The same hand that hurts you heals you. From one disaster and after another, he delivers you. No matter what the calamity, the evil can't touch you. Job speaks. All I want is an answer to one prayer, a last request to be honored. Let God step on me, squash me like a bug, and be done with me for good. I'd at least have the satisfaction of not having blasphemed the holy God. Before being pressed past the limits, where is the strength to keep my hopes up? What future do I have to keep me going? Do you think I have nerves of steel? Do you think I'm made out of iron? Do you think I can pull myself up by my bootstraps? Why, I don't even have boots. Confront me with the truth, and I sh I I'll shut up. Show me where I've gone off track. Honest words never hurt anyone. But what's the point of all this pious bluster? You pretend to tell me what's wrong with my life, but treat my words of anguish as so much hot air. Are people mere things to you? Are friends just items of profit and loss? Look me in the eyes. Do you think I'd lie to your face? Think it over. No double talk. Think carefully. My integrity is on the line. Can you detect anything false in what I say? Don't you trust me to discern good from evil? Eliphaz of Taman spoke a second time. If you were truly wise, would you sound so much like a windbag belching out hot air? Would you talk nonsense in the middle of a serious argument babbling baloney? Would you... Oh, sorry, I read that again. <laughs> Look at you. You trivialize religion and turn spiritual conversation into empty gossip. It's your sin that taught you to talk this way. You choose an education in fraud. Your own words have exposed your guilt. It's nothing I've said. You've incriminated yourself. Do you think you're the first person to have to deal with these things? I've a thing or two to tell you, so listen up. I'm letting you in on my views. It's what wise men and women have always taught, holding back nothing from what they were taught by their parents back in the days when they had this land all to themselves. Those who live by their own rules, not God's, can expect nothing but trouble, and the longer they live, the worse it gets. Then Job defended himself. I've had all I can take of your talk. What a bunch of miserable comfortable comforter, comforters. Is there no end to your windbag speeches? What's your problem that you go on and on like this? If you were in my shoes, I could, just, I could talk just like you. I, I could put together a terrific harangu and really let you have it. But I'd never do that. I'd console and comfort and make things better, not worse. that says that you did something wrong, Job. This is why you get all your suffering. And Job says, wait a second. I know what I do. And there's no way that I could, whatever I did, would not deserve to lose my job, my children, or my health. And so what is it? And tonight as we take a look at, this is a powerful part now, this next ch chapter with Job and God dialogue. It was over 35 chapters in Job in the Old Testament that these three friends, actually four friends, continued to dig at Job saying, you did something wrong, you did something wrong. And Job kept going back, no, God is this judge. He's just a judge and he plows over anyone he wants. They're both at loss. So now let's listen to the dialogue of God in Job. And now, finally, God answered Job from the eye of a violent storm. He said, Why do you confuse the issue? Why do you talk without knowing what you're talking about? Pull yourself together, Job. On your feet. Stand tall. I have, something, I have some questions for you, and I want some straight answers. Where were you when I created the earth? Tell me, since you know so much. Who decided on, the, on its size? Certainly you'll know that. Why, who came up with the blueprints and measurements? How was it foundation poured? And who set the cornerstone? 
Well, the morning stars sang in chorus, and all the angels shouted in praise. And who took charge of the ocean when it gushed forth like a baby from the womb? That was me. I ripped it into the soft wrapped it in the soft clouds. I tucked it safe that night. Then I made a play playpen for it, a strong playpen, so it couldn't run loose, and said, stay here, this is your place. Your wild tantrums in are confined to this place. And have you ever ordered morning? Get up, told Don, get to work. So you could seize earth like a blanket and shake the rink wicked like cockroaches as the sun brings everything to light, brings out all the colors and shapes. The cover of darkness is snatched from the wicked. They're caught in that very act. Have you ever gotten to the true bottom of things? Explored the labyrinthine, labyrinthine cave of the deep ocean. Do you know the first thing about death? Do you have one clue regarding death's dark mysteries? And do you have any idea how large the earth is? Speak up if you have even the beginning of an answer. Do you know where light comes from and where darkness lives so you can take them by the hand and lead them home when they get lost? Why, of course you know that. You've known them all your life, growing up in the same neighborhood with them. Job answered, I'm speechless, in awe, words fail me. I should never have opened my mouth, I'm convinced. You can do anything and everything. Nothing and no one can upset your plans. You asked, who is this muddying the water, ignorantly confusing the issues, second-guessing my purposes? I admit, I was the one. I babbled on about things far beyond me, made small talk about wonders way over my head. You told me, listen and let me do the talking. Let me ask the questions. You give the answers. I admit, I once lived by rumors of you. Now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'll never do that again. I promise. I'll never again live on crusts of heresy, crumbs of rumor. I've talked too much, way too much. I'm ready to shut up and listen. I love chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41. Because God comes out of Job in a storm. All right? This is a mean God right here. And sarcastic. He goes, Job, look all this that has happened that I put together. Of course you know all this. You've, you were here right from the beginning, right, Job? Not. The great creator. And so the suffering tonight that we take a look at, why do bad things happen to good people as first of all, you remember from Adam and Eve. It's called freedom. Freedom to love or not to love. Boy, every one of our parents would love to control you guys. You know, when you eat, where you see what your friends you have, where you go to school, where you go to work, they want to protect you, make sure everything's fine. Would you enjoy that? No. Just like Adam and Eve, we like the door and have that freedom. So the first part is anybody really good. <laughs> we love that freedom. We love that independence. And of course, Satan is out there to trick us and do whatever. Those interviews up there was awesome. They all were complete and right. The two things I want to encourage you tonight is that with Job, is that bad things happen to everyone. Why? Because we have that freedom to love or not to love. To obey or not to obey. And sometimes when people don't obey out there, it causes a ripple effect in our lives as well. And when we don't obey, it causes a ripple effect to those people out there. It happens. But why does God allow it? Because he's such a great God and he created all this. Is that he wants a family. A family that's not forced to come to him, but wants to be with him. The reason why suffering, he allows suffering, is for us to go to him. He's an awesome God, and we have an incredible life, no matter what pain we go through. I mentioned this morning, we had an incredible sadness yesterday with about a Chris who passed away at the age of 22. And all his buddies came in, and they listened to Slayer, Metallica, Megadeth, and all talks about ugliness but not only their music the blues do that the country we all talk about sin and death and ugliness 
But the key tonight is that who do you rely on? And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Job chapter 19, even though Job doesn't understand it, he says a powerful line that we sing on Easter. I know that my Redeemer lives. And when my skin has fallen apart, when my earthly body goes to the ground, I shall see my Redeemer face to face. First part is to always rely on God. And joy, we can never be strong. It's only God through Jesus Christ to be strong. And then the second one, why suffer happens, that he allows it, for us to be a witness to others. When you go through difficult times, people watch you, and they see how you act. And when eventually you start relying on Jesus, they get to see that power and love, and they can focus on their, their weakness on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I had two funerals I did yesterday. The other one was an uh, elderly man in his 80s. And he was with the Nazi army as a teenager growing up in Germany. He was forced to fight. He got captured by the Americans. He was in a POW camp for a while. When he got out, what did he do? He came to America and he joined the Marines. He had suffering as a teenager. But then when he got rescued, he relied on the incredible grace of God with his church and his family. And then he showed what's the good thing to do. So in our study tonight, when you go through difficult times, when you're suffering, when God takes away family or friends or your jobs or whatever, it's not always your fault. It's his world's fault. It's his freedom that we wanted so much. And that's part of freedom is that we will lose things. But the key is to rely on Jesus. Let him be your strength. I love it when some say, well, it makes us stronger. Well, we go to Jesus for strength. He's our strength. Let's thank these guys for our Reader's Theater tonight. Let's put our hands together. Jordan, our messengers. Jordan, hit the lights. Our next song is Words. At this time, we want to have our time of just a private time with Jesus. Um, whether we're Job thinking God is just a judge and he's just, we're pawns and he's trying to just control us or make our life miserable, or we feel like others deserve the punishment and sufferings that they're going through. Let's take this time in confession. You can close your eyes, you can look at the screen, but let's come to the Lord asking for forgiveness of the many times that we forget that he is a great God, bigger than any of our difficulties, and, um, and he's here to guide us through those. So let's depend on our Lord and Savior tonight. Lord Jesus, we come before you as your, as your brother and sister in the faith. Lord, forgive us of the many times that we just think you are way too harsh on us in our lives or our family. That we, we never see the big picture in the journey of our suffering. We, we love the freedom, Lord. We love the independence. But we don't like the responsibility that causes us pain or others. And so we take a moment of the quietness of our hearts that we feel like we're a better judge or we feel others deserve that pain or any other sins that we're struggling with or evil that we're struggling with or relationships with others. We want to totally depend on you. And so we take the quietness of our hearts and give you that sadness, difficulties, relationships back to you. As you're giving your life to your Lord tonight, as we need to do every night, we're going to have a song now called by Lose My Soul. It's surrendering our lives to the Lord by Toby Mack. What were you when I created the world, the ocean, the animals? In those chapters, in Job chapter 38 through 42, it goes, I even created the dinosaurs, all the animals. Listen, if I created all good things, 
I'll take care of you, my most precious creator, creation. And that's our joy tonight, is we have good news. God is bigger than any of our sufferings. And he loves you and sent Jesus Christ to redeem us. And that's what we celebrate, to surrender our lives to Jesus. And so I have precious news. In the quietness of your heart tonight or this past week, if you confess your downfalls, Jesus has forgiven you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, we want to close our service in prayer time and our closing song. What we like to do is have you guys come forward and can do a semicircle. All right, maybe between the first two rows of chairs here. And uh, we'll have prayer time. And then we'll um, close with beautiful. All right. We don't hold hands here in this church. All right, that's... <laughs> Let's, um, what's some prayers that we can lift up together as a group tonight? Um, any joy, answer prayers, or concerns? Dennis Voss, yeah, Natasha, and Quentin, Jeffrey's grandfather. All right, that's a fun school. I want to join that school. That's uh, all right. Any others? Your prayers or family or friends are going through a difficult time that we can lift up. I need five. Okay, I got two. You know, Satan kind of, Satan comes, um, it, you know, he, he wants to get us all down, doesn't he? And so he create, you know, breaks up families, and so we pray for that family tonight in all relationships. And that's, um, all right. Olivia? You have your, okay, you have your, your, your test tomorrow to be a, uh, Beautician, is that right? And so what time do you have to be there tomorrow? 8.30. So it's pretty intense, isn't it? You're a nurse. All right. So you've been studying for over how long? Oh, forever. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so she has her big exam tomorrow. So she's going to be a beautician up here. And so we pray, um, we pray for her tonight. All right. Anyone else? You know what I like to do? I do a lot of praying. And, um, and we're a body of Christ. Would somebody like to pray for Dennis Voss tonight and his health? Who would like to? All right. Perfect. You pray for Dennis. We all pray behind um, Megan. But would you just pray? And it's just simple prayers. You don't have to. Um, who would like to um, pray for um, families um, in general, families that definitely um, Mandy knows but are going through a difficult time? Would someone like to pray for that family tonight? And ask Satan to stay away and let that family heal. Anybody like to do that? All right, Mandy, great. That's, uh, um, we want to pray for school tomorrow, going back to school. Anybody have any homework or paper due tonight? Everybody got everything done? All right. <laughs> all right, Michelle. All right, who would like to pray for school and the safe trip to Flagstaff tomorrow? Who would like to... Okay, you'll pray for school, Josh. It's really important for us. And you know what? Don't worry. It's like talking to a friend, prayer. It's just talking to a friend and, um, and say, Lord, hey, be with, you know, whatever. Olivia. We will pray for Olivia tomorrow. All right, Drew, for her exam. All right. And um, any other prayers in the quiet of our hearts? So let's pray. Gracious Lord, we come before you now, and we have concerns. And we, you are bigger than any of our concerns. And so, Lord, hear our prayers. Um, we begin with Megan.
praying. I want to share one story as we close with beautiful is that the disciples were walking with Jesus. They saw someone who's been lame from birth. And they go, Lord, whose fault is it? The parents or him? And what did Jesus say? Neither. This type of suffering and all kinds of suffering is to glorify Jesus, glorify God, because he can over give us the ability to overcome our challenges. We're going to close now with a beautiful song. It's also the book marker we want you to take home with you um, called Beautiful by Mercy Me. Our great pictures. Okay, our theme for next month is forgiveness. Interviews will be with Megan tonight as you leave. The interview is two questions. Why is it so hard to forgive? And then how many times will you forgive the same person? So those are the questions tonight, and then we'll play them next month. Thanks for being with us. Now we know we'll have pizza at 5.30 if you want some dinner with us tonight. So um, thank you for coming. God's blessings on your evening. All right.